Welcome to Digital Asset News to get top stories in crypto current digital assets and break it down to bite sized pieces. Today, we've got some pretty interesting things. First up, this is from Coin Telegraph, the magazine, and it's titled As Money Printer Goes Burr, Wall Street Loses Its Fear of Bitcoin. This kind of takes a look at what's going on with the institutional market and where things are headed. It's a pretty well written article and there's a lot of different pieces to it, so we're going to dive deep. Also, a Texas man allegedly used over a million dollars in coronavirus relief funds to buy cryptocurrency. Probably a pretty good move as far as an investment goes, but really bad move as far as legal. But before we get into that, let's take a look at what's going on in the market. So today it is tax day, July 15th. It is uh, 9.20 Nebraska time. I'm actually in Nebraska visiting family. And that's why I haven't uh, put out a video in a couple of days. So uh, let's see what the heck is going on. So first up, Bitcoin is Bitcoin. <laughs> 9224 hasn't moved much at all. Uh, it's up a whopping 0.4% in 24 hours. Ethereum, roughly the same thing. Tether's Tether. XRP, up 7% for the week. That's pretty good. Uh, Bitcoin Cash is at 0.0. .0. Cardano making a massive run and in that number six spot. So congratulations, everybody's holding on to Cardano. Up 12%, almost at uh, going up to maybe 0.15, who knows. Bitcoin SV is, eh, whatever. And Chainlink, over 24 hours, is up 16%. On seven day, it's at 51%. I think it's gonna hit $10 uh, pretty soon. Now, remember, what goes up must come down, so don't FOMO into this one. Um, if you've been following the channel, you know that I'm a big believer in Chainlink and I bought it a long time ago. Maybe now is not the perfect time to get it, uh, but that's up to you. And everything else is pretty much the same. Tezo is up 6%, 7%. VeChain, another massive run, 9%, 12% for the week, and it's almost going to hit that two cent spot. And the rumor was, I had actually teased this. This was sent to me by a subscriber, and they had said that there's a rumor that VeChain is actually partnering up with Apple uh, for on-chain analytics and tracking so we'll see if that actually pans out you know rumors are good for price action and when they're actually proved true it can be even better so we will see anyhow let's jump into today's stories before we get that article about the institutional investors i want to say that uh, i've been getting a ton of emails from eToro Apparently, a lot of different people uh, are uh, adding them, adding me or Dent Digital Asset News to their watch list to follow my trades, which I think is uh, hilarious because I don't trade. I'm an investor. I don't. Uh, I don't do any trading. I don't do swing trades, long-term trades. I just. I just buy and hold essentially. So I was. I was wondering. I'm like over the last two or three weeks, I'm getting more and more and more of these. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? So I had to take a look at my actual eToro account, and what it has is. Uh, Actually, I started off with eToro months and months ago. I don't use them anymore because I'm heavily disappointed in their customer service. It's just awful. Uh, I've lost some money, and uh, I don't know where it is. And it's been taking me. It's taken me over, you know, over a month for them to respond, and they still don't have an answer. So um, I don't know what's going on, and I cannot recommend them. And if you've taken a look at my uh, exchange and wallet uh, Google spreadsheet. This is everything that I, I use or have used uh, right now. And you can take, you can find the link to this in the description of every one of my videos. It looks exactly like this. And you can see here like everything from the from the fees, selling fees, the conversion rates, the staking fees, loans, uh, how much it costs to fund, um, different things as far as like uh, for uh, accrued interest. So everything you want to know is pretty much right here. And it's a, uh, it's a comprehensive list, would say. But uh, you can see why I only recommend Coinbase for an off-ramp, uh, Gemini, I was using pretty heavily. Uh, now I'm not. Now I'm actually using uh, my two favorite one-two punches, Voyager uh, to buy everything because it's it's no fees, and Celsius uh, to uh, to accumulate interest because it's just fantastic and it works. That's what that's the big thing. But uh, on here, I think over here in the last row, uh, eToro, and I pretty much say why I do not recommend them anymore, and it's a trading platform. So. If you want to take a look at that in the story, then it's right there. But uh, um, I cannot recommend eToro in any way, shape, or form. Anyhow, uh, the, the question I have was, why was is everybody following me as a trader? I'm not a trader. And I took a look at it, and um, I had bought Ethereum. I bought one and a half units at $173. So I'm actually up 36% as far as profit and loss. But Cardano was the big winner here because I'm actually up 163%. I bought Cardano at uh, less than a nickel. And right now we're, you know, we're coming up at the almost 13 cents. So 
When you take a look at eToro, just be careful because like I've allocated a whopping $550 and my profit was $569. So, I mean, I'm up pretty big for uh, just these last three or four months. The thing about eToro is that you can copy traders uh, that have, and it's mostly just by, by percentages gained. So I understand why people are doing it. They're looking at me and going, oh, wow, this guy must be a genius trader because he's up so much. No, I'm an idiot. I'm actually, yeah, I'm a moron. And uh, all I do is just, uh, you know, invest and I just do a, a slow push. So uh, eToro, like here is Matty Greenspan. And if you just no, don't know him, he, he's, uh, he was big with eToro. I think he was not a member, but I know he used to work for them. Now he does uh, quantum economics. And for the month, he's up a whopping 8%. If we can change that to three months, he's up 61% uh, and, over, and over six months, excuse me. He's up uh, 46%. So there you can take a look at, you know, a trader is a trader, right? Um, they can do whatever they do. But uh, I mean, to me, I just don't understand the whole process. I'm like, just invest, dollar cost average in, everything works out. And I actually take a look at, I'm like, well, if Matty Greenspan, who's like a super great trader, you know, how's everybody else doing in, in the uh, eToro space or the top trader? You can take a look at uh, all these different people that are on here. So like, uh, I don't know who K Fish is, but I guess he's one of the best ones. He's got negative uh, 1% for the for the yearly return. Uh, this gentleman here, Crypto Kevin, 22% for the year. Great. Maddie for the year, 37%. I don't know who this is. Uh, this cool Christ, I'm not sure, 3%. Uh, here's Data Dash. He's up a whopping uh, almost 2%. And uh, here's a guy who's down 40% as a trader, business school, great. So the, the thing is about with eToro, like, I mean, all these guys, I'm sure they do not trade on eToro. I'm sure they, if, if they do do a little bit of trading, uh, they probably did it for a while and they jump ship to something else better that has better customer service and just better overall. So if you're looking at like Data Dash here and you're like, wow, what an awful trader. I'm sure he's a much better trader uh, on other platforms. But if you're looking at this, uh, you're like, wow, this isn't so great. So uh, again, if you're following eToro, just be careful. It's not about the percentages. I mean, look at me. All I did was just just invest slowly, and uh, I'm up like over 100%. Which kind of leads me to my last point, um, which is, you know, if you everybody knows on this channel, I'm not a big trader. But you know, I mean, if you want to trade, that's cool. I mean, do what you want to do. Um, if you want to do like 80% investing, 20% trading or 50, 50 or 70, or whatever it is, I, you know, whatever floats your bill. Fantastic. But just be careful with all the people out there that are selling you courses and, you know, uh, do this with me cause I'm an awesome trader and everything else. Um, I don't think that honestly, I mean, some, I don't think the traders really, uh, divulge all of their fees and everything else, uh, that, that they say makes them so hugely profitable. Right. I mean, we're just going by somebody's, you know, what they say. And sometimes that's not worth uh, the paper it's written on. So like I will just tell you this, like um, I'm a small business owner. One of my businesses is, is an Amazon online business. And uh, when I first got into it, uh, I actually, I thought I was making a ton of money. And then when I took, when I added up all, all the fees and, you know, the selling items and the storage fees and everything else, I'm like, wow, I, I didn't make that much at all because you have to look at all the different fees that you have. So like all these people that say like, oh, just trade with me, I'll make this much money. Just be careful because if you add up all the fees that are out there, uh, sometimes you're not making squat. Anyhow, let's move into today's top story. So first up, Cointelegraph has a magazine, great. And uh, they get to put together like a couple of stories uh, weekly. And this one was, um, it was written by Andrew Fenton. Who's Andrew Fenton? Andrew's based in Australia. He's a freelance journalist and editor covering cryptocurrency and blockchain. Worked as a national entertainment writer for News Corp Australia. Uh, film journalist in the Melbourne Weekly. So I don't think he's got like a super strong uh, type of background in the financial industry, but what he talks about here is still relevant and he's got a lot of good sources. So let's just dig right in. So the first part, I'm not going to go over, it's kind of boring. Second part here is where he talks about sea of change on the Wall Street. And um, what he's going to talk about here is how the sentiment is changing on Wall Street and institutional investors are coming in, which is the same thing we've been talking about on this channel for uh, you know months now. And I can see it, and uh, he just gives specific references, so I want to talk about it. So first part here, he talks about uh, Nathan Montone, co-founder of M31 Capital, lives on Wall Street right across from the stock exchange. 27-year-old, he started trading Bitcoin in 2011. Also noticed a big shift in attitudes. He says, it's crazy how fast opinion is changing. Until very recently, it's been the case that if you talk to any traditional investment banker 
or anyone in private equity, they'd really be saying things like, hey, get that internet money out of my face. Or I remember that from 2017, isn't it dead now? And I got to tell you, it's the same thing. When I talk to friends and family and acquaintances about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, they're like, oh, Bitcoin, I remember that thing. Wasn't it like 20,000? I mean, they'll, they'll always get that, that number right. <laughs> yeah, they'll say, hey, wasn't it about 20,000, about 20, 2017? Now it's like nothing. And you're like, well, you know, yeah, it did. It actually took a took took a big dip, just like everything else in the stock market. And um, yeah, but right now it's uh, sitting around ten thousand. So it's actually the best performing asset class of all time, and it's being the part of the S and P five hundred and the Dow. So if you want to go over there and invest your money and make, uh, you know, I don't know, eight thirteen percent, go right ahead. But uh, if you invested in March, uh, you'd be up three hundred percent. So stick that in your pipe and smoke it. Anyhow, so moving on. He states, my cap table is full of angel investors, and there's some guys that years ago would have thought Bitcoin is like a toy or scam. Now they're actively reaching out and asking, hey, tell me more about how Bitcoin works. Can you see me, send me a couple of research papers so I can get up to speed and understand it more, which makes a lot of sense. And then uh, he states here, part of, the appeal, part of the appeal is getting in early on an emerging asset class like internet stocks in the 90s. But he, he agrees with uh, Montona Ta that a major catalyst is a loss of faith in the system. We can see that right now with quantitative easing and the different uh, volatility in the stock market per se. And there's a big disconnect between the actual stock market and the economy. And we have a mass amount of unemployment. Small businesses are closing at a rapid pace. However, the stock market just seems to go up. It doesn't really matter, which is exactly what he says here in the, uh, in the article. He says, everything's overvalued. Real estate is overvalued. Bonds are definitely overvalued. Equities, everything you can think of. I think the biggest catalyst for that is printing trillions of dollars. This feeling that people increasingly have that maybe their U.S. dollar are not as safe as they thought they were. And this is the exact same sentiment. Uh, there was a podcast, Unchained, and they had Mike Novogratz and uh, Raul Pal. And uh, the moderator said, what is the, going to be the catalyst for Bitcoin? Is it because of quantitative easing and the uh, potential uh, interest rates or um, hyperinflation and the poor economic policy? And Mike Novogratz said, bingo, that's exactly the big uh, use case right now for Bitcoin because people are worried about the monetary policy that is being set forth by the United States and globally by the central banks. He goes, people are uh, individuals and, and corporations and the central banks themselves are just printing uh, money like there's no tomorrow. So we don't know what's going to happen, but... Uh, Bitcoin is that, uh, as, as it's called, schmuck insurance by uh, Shamath Pelihapitaya. And it makes sense to me. Moving on, it states that's really driving the narrative and it's causing people who didn't take Bitcoin seriously three, four, or five years ago to say maybe, hey, let's uh, invest 1% or 3% or 5% into my portfolio. And that's what I've been saying the whole time. I mean, I don't understand why you can't have uh, financial planners talking to their clients and go, look, Pete, uh, there's a lot of volatility going on. We've got a lot of problems. Why don't we set aside um, like 1% to 5% of your portfolio and put it into this new emerging asset class called uh, Bitcoin or cryptocurrency digital assets? And as a matter of fact, it is the best performing asset class of all time. And I'm going to illustrate this, this point perfectly in this video, which talks about the investment of the decade. This is actually uh, one of the videos that uh, I put out, well, like three or four weeks ago or so. And I just took a look at you know the, the, the top performing ROI over the last decade. And you can see like all these things, Visa, Google, these, I mean, Amazon, Apple, the, you know, the big companies that are out there, Netflix, Lululemon, huh, who would have thought? Uh, and dominoes. I mean, this is like uh, over the last 10 years, how the return on investment has been. So I'm going to speed this up to the 2013. And you see this little thing called Bitcoin. And all of a sudden, it's going to shoot all the way to the top and get into the thousands, which is pretty amazing, right? And uh, when you're thinking about it, like all these different uh, uh, people that uh, are, they're talking to as far as like their clients, why wouldn't they just say, hey, you know, over the last decade, this isn't a flash in the pan. This isn't like the tulip bubble, which lasted for a very short amount of time, which is so stupid. I hate to hear that thing. Um, we're seeing uh, in, in a massive amount of return on investment if we just invest into something called Bitcoin. And only Bitcoin. I mean, there's uh, what they would consider altcoins uh, into something like, oh, I don't know, a little thing called uh, Ethereum. 
And uh, that actually is doing pretty well too. And then also there's other things called Chainlink and Cardano and, and XRP and Tomato Coin and everything else that you want to think about. And uh, those are doing exceptionally well. So uh, we can still invest in the S&P 500, but if we just do one to 5%, and everything works out like I think it's gonna work out, it could be the best performing asset uh, that you have in your portfolio, and we can mitigate a lot of risks. And uh, not only that, as time goes on, this 5% could uh, you know, be the real money maker out of the other 95. Anyway, I'm moving on. Alfred says, sophisticated investors aren't looking for an altcoin to moon. They want limited exposure to a risky asset as part of a structured portfolio strategy. He states my friends are reaching out because they know I can put it in context because they don't want to talk to somebody who just says 100% Bitcoin, which makes a lot of sense. When I'm talking to people, I don't always just say, you know what, you should put all your money into Bitcoin right now. Take it all the stock market and put it into Bitcoin because it's the only thing that's going to last. That just sounds ridiculous. I mean, how many times have you heard, don't put your eggs in one basket? So you are not going to say those things to all these people. So I think it just sounds a little bit more level-headed just to go, you know what, you know, uh, 1% to 5% of your portfolio just to, you know, kind of get them in. Think of it like a um, like a gateway drug. You know, you don't want to just say, hey, go all in on this. You know, just say, hey, you know, slowly get your feet wet and then you can learn about it. And I think the more people learn about uh, Bitcoin, which I think is Bitcoin's a gateway drug to, to all altcoins. Once they get into that, then they start to think about, oh, what's this Ethereum? What's a smart contract? Oh, what's an Oracle? Oh, what is... Uh, all these other things that are out there. Maybe I should take a look at this and wow, look at the impressive gains. And before you know it, they're all in. So I think don't scare people off. <laughs> that's, that's just my philosophy. Don't scare people off. Just give them the information that they, that they have. Let them learn on their own. And uh, it usually should work out okay. And moving down, the increasing interest from the top end of town is not just anecdotal. Institution-focused crypto asset manager Grayscale Investments has seen assets under management grow by 250% just this year alone uh, to $4.1 billion. And we had actually taken a look at this in their Q1 report. And what was interesting to know about this one is that this was put out in April after the Q1, and the assets under management was $2.2 billion at that point. Remember, this is April. Right now, we're talking about middle of July. And what they have going on now is it went from $2.2 billion to 4.1 billion. That is a massive, massive gain in a short amount of time. And just says to me that, hey, people are here and they want to invest. Anyhow, a Fidelity survey of 774 institutional investors, including pension funds, family offices, investment consultants, and hedge funds across five months to March, found that 36% already had exposure to crypto. Europe leads the way with 45%, uh, with US to 22 to 27. And Fidelity's Tom Jessup noted this, these results confirm a trend we are seeing in the market towards greater interest in and acceptance of digital assets as a new investable asset class. And it only makes sense. If you're a financial planner, I think it is advice or investment advice malpractice to not talk about, not even just to not even talk about Bitcoin. Just go look over the last 10 years. I mean, this has outperformed everything. S&P 500, the Dow, oil, gold, stocks, everything you think of. It is outperformed. So uh, I'm just going to give this information to you and you can make a decision. But I think one to five percent is a decent amount of money. And imagine if every single financial planner said that to all of their clients and they and let's say they didn't do five. Let's say they all did three percent. We would have a multi trillion dollar market cap easily. Uh, within months. It would just be that simple. The problem is they're not doing it because they don't have, first of all, the regulation isn't in place. Second of all, it's, it's difficult for these institutional investors to actually put money uh, into the cryptocurrency digital asset market because there's all these different hoops that they have to uh, go through because that's how it works. So as time goes on and the roads already been or the tracks already been laid, I think they're going to actually find uh, in a nice little inroad and we're going to see a nice little pump. Anyhow, moving down, moving down. And this is going to sum it all up. It's called Arrival of the King and it states well known adopters from initial finance like Mike Novogratz. Tim Draper and Raul Paul have recently joined Paul Tudor Jones, the founder and CEO of Tudor Investments. And I know we've talked about Paul Tudor Jones more than once on this channel, but um, I think it's interesting to note about why it's so important that Paul Tudor Jones got in. And it states the 65-year-old billionaire hedge fund made his fortune predicting 
and shorting the 1987 stock market crash. So it's telling that in the midst of this year's financial crash, he chose to allocate 1% and 2% of his assets to Bitcoin. Now, granted, it is Bitcoin futures, but it is Bitcoin, and he believes in it. He states, when I think of Bitcoin, I look at it as one of my tiny part of my portfolio, but it may end up being the best performer of all of them. I kind of think it might be, he told CNBC. So one of the world's top macroeconomic traders says he finds the inflation hedge narrative of Bitcoin compelling. Ears perk up. Monotone says Jones' announcement marked a coming of age for Bitcoin. By publicly announcing he's buying it for himself and for clients, you know if you're a fund manager who is thinking you get fired for doing it, you can now always point to Paul Theodore Jones and say, hey, he did that. And uh, that guy's a legend, so we're going to go with that. It's removed career risk for traditional investors who are interested in the value drivers behind Bitcoin and scare assets but don't want to get uh, fired for pitching it. I think that's what's going to happen. So last two things I'll say is this. Um, last time when we broke that story about Paul Tudor Jones, there was a couple of comments that would say, hey, you know, Paul Tudor Jones, the only reason that he's actually saying that he's getting into Bitcoin is so that everybody can come in and he can short it and he can make a ton of money. That's the only reason big investors will say those types of things. And I was like, it could be a point. But I thought about it, and it seems like we're going the opposite direction. I think that maybe he told everybody his position so they would all come in and join him and actually get into Bitcoin and push that price up. I think you can make, I'm uh, pretty sure you can make money either way. I think there's more of an upside to Bitcoin, uh, especially if all of the different uh, financial players come in. So uh, that's what I think. All right, let's move on. Last up, Texas man, not me, allegedly used a million dollars to buy crypto, which is pretty pretty funny, actually. A Texas resident was charged by the U.S. Attorney, uh, Southern District of Texas, on July 14th, just yesterday. Allegations suggest, and he always have to, always have to say suggest, because he can't say that he's guilty until proven guilty, that he fraudulently filed loan applications for $1.1 million through the PPP, or the Paycheck Protection Program. He claimed that he was seeking COVID-19 relief, but it actually used it uh, to purchase crypto. So according to the allegations, uh, this guy made false statements to financial institutions. He claimed that uh, Argyres committed wire fraud by establishing a scheme to file the applications to the SBA. So what essentially he did, he filed coronavirus relief applications on behalf of two companies named Texas Barbecue and Houston Landscaping, just where I live. He falsely claimed that both businesses had numerous employees and hundreds of thousands of dollars in payroll expenses. Now, if that was true or not, not for sure. But uh, what happened was the money they received uh, for both of these companies, he actually went into Coinbase and bought a ton of cryptocurrency. <laughs> Unbelievable. So all I'm saying for this article is, that, is this. If you don't think that Big Brother knows uh, exactly what's going on, whether that be a, a a large amount of money or a small amount of money, you need to think again because everything is being reported to the IRS and that's especially in the US. Now, throughout the globe uh, in different parts, I, I still believe it's the same thing. They, you still are, have to go through the Anti-Money Laundering Act, the KYC. That's why when you sign up, uh, you have to you know, uh, upload your, your picture ID. So nothing's really changed here. So I'm just telling everybody, this is just a PSA, just to be careful, because if you've invested, just know that uh, your government knows. And uh, if you're in the U.S., just realize that taxes are due today. It's July 15th. And if you are filling out your taxes and the first question comes up, which is this, at any time during 2019, did you receive, sell, send, exchange, or otherwise acquire any financial interest in any virtual currency? If you say no, and then they go to any of the exchanges and you've got something on there, I don't know what can happen, honestly. I'm not, I don't work for the IRS, but I can tell you from someone who has been audited in the past, uh, you don't ever wanna go through that. So I'm just saying that uh, you might wanna actually say yes. Now, if you're having problems with your taxes, just use what I use. It's called CryptoTrader.tax. In the description uh, of every one of my videos, there's a link that looks like this and it allows you to get 20% off. And you can, you can pour through spreadsheets. I mean, if you've only got like five or 10 transactions, then just do it that way, it's simple, right? But if you're like me, who's had a ton of different transactions, I've bought a lot of cryptocurrency since 2017, and I want to go back and make sure that uh, I'm good to go, then you're going to definitely want to use CryptoTrader.tax because when I did it, I set it all up, and within 30 minutes, I was done. And I sent it over to my uh, accountant. She took a look at it. We took some losses in, in certain parts because there was a thing called uh, loss profit loss harvesting, and uh, it worked out pretty well. So real quick, I'll just show you. I'll show you my account. Let me log in. 
there's me. I'm going to sign in. First thing I'm going to do, I'm going to select exchanges. So I got Binance, Coinbase, Coinbase Pro, and Huobi. Yeah, Huobi. What are you going to do? I'm going to click next. And then for each one, it's going to have you put the API key in. And then you, all you got to do is just, if you don't know uh, where to get that, just read the, the guides for each one. Like Coinbase, all you got to do is just log in. That's pretty awesome. And then once you get all that, you click next. This I leave uh, to the default because it just makes it easy. And then uh, these are, it pulls in all of your all of your uh, different buying and selling and trades and everything else. And I've got 579 items. That's a lot of stuff. And I went all the way back to 2017 because I wanted to make sure. And just so you know, uh, it says missing data has been detected. So out of all that 579, this is what they couldn't find. Four. Four different transactions. And you know why? Because of Huobi. Well, we sucks and they won't uh, give my information, which I don't really care because all I did was I just clicked on invite your tax pro and I just, uh, it just has you put your email in for your tax professional, your CPA, and they review it and then off you go. So she already told me what to do. I'm good. And then you just click next. We'll create a report. And there you are, 2017, 18, 19, all done. And that's it. So uh, if you have any problems, uh, just reach out to them. They're pretty good. I love it. I use it. I, I trust it. That's the big thing. And I just want you to uh, not have so many headaches. All right, that's it for today's video. So thanks for sticking with me. I really appreciate it. Uh, just so you know, I want to say thanks to all the supporters out there. Uh, level ones, which is uh, as of this month is all there is. Uh, I got away with a level two because level two um, is giving individual shout outs and uh, just taking a little bit too much time. So level ones, um, thanks so much. It's a tip, really. It's like a it's like a buck 99. So thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it. Level twos, they paid a little bit more and I'm just going to tell them, uh, don't pay me, just buy more crypto. <laughs> That's the best thing I can tell you. So thanks to All Right Soft, Win Mullet, myself, who else? Dave Plummer, Grant Sharman, Bruce Wood, Baking Benjamins, Noah Flippin' Vegas, Martin Lewin, Michael Ralph, William Howell, Crazy Crypto Connect, Tessie Ryusaki Positive, Troc LLC, JC Durex, Matt Slack, John Miller, The Office, L. Merg, Michael Jeffrey, The Kell Show, Andrew Herrera, Terry Prospery, EOS UK, whatever, AE, and Hero Soap Company, they make soap. And uh, last thing, watch out for the scams. We have been getting hit with scams like crazy, but my email is at news with an S. The scammer is at new. So uh, make sure you avoid that person like the plague if they send you anything, because they're gonna ask you to trade and I don't trade, which we just talked about. And that's it. So thanks a lot for sticking with me. Appreciate it. See you on the next one.